Section 12 of Psychopathology of Everyday Life. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Psychopathology of Everyday Life by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Read by Mary Schneider. Chapter 12 Determinism, Chance, and Superstitious Beliefs. Part 1 Point of View. As the general result of the preceding separate discussions, we must put down the following principle certain inadequacies of our psychic capacities whose common character will soon be more definitely determined and certain performances which are apparently unintentional prove to be well motivated when subjected to the psychoanalytic investigation and are determined through the consciousness of unknown motives in order to belong to this class of phenomena thus explained a faulty psychic action must satisfy the following conditions a it must not exceed a certain measure which is firmly established through our estimation and is designated by the expression within normal limits b it must evince the character of the momentary and temporary disturbance the same action must have been previously performed more correctly or we must always rely on ourselves to perform it more correctly if we are corrected by others we must immediately recognize the truth of the correction and the incorrectness of our psychic action c if we at all perceive a faulty action we must not perceive in ourselves any motivation of the same but must attempt to explain it through inattention or attribute it to an accident thus there remain in this group the cases of forgetting and the errors despite better knowledge the lapses in speaking reading writing and erroneously carried out actions and the so-called chance actions the explanations of these so definite psychic processes are connected with a series of observations which may in part arouse our further interest one by abandoning a part of our psychic capacity as unexplainable through purposive ideas we ignore the realms of determinism in our mental life here as in all other spheres determinism reaches farther than we suppose in the year nineteen hundred i read an essay published in the zeit written by the literary historian r m meyer in which he maintains and illustrates by example that it is impossible to compose nonsense intentionally and arbitrarily for some time i have been aware that it is impossible to think of a number or even of a name of one's own free will if one investigates this seeming voluntary formation let us say of a number of many digits uttered in unrestrained mirth it always proves to be so strictly determined that the determination seems impossible i will now briefly discuss an example of an arbitrarily chosen first name and then exhaustively analyze an analogous example of a thoughtlessly uttered number while preparing the history of one of my patients for publication i considered what first name i would give him in the article there seemed to be a wide choice of course certain names were at once excluded by me in the first place the real name then the names of members of my family to which i would have objected also some female names having an especially peculiar pronunciation but excluding these there should have been no need of being puzzled about such a name it would be thought and i myself supposed that a whole multitude of feminine names would be placed at my disposal instead of this only one sprang up no other besides it it was the name dora i inquired at its determination who else is called dora i wished to reject the next idea as incredulous it occurred to me that the nurse of my sister's children was named dora but i possessed so much self-control or practice in analysis if you like that i held firmly to the idea and proceeded then a slight incident of the previous evening soon flashed through my mind which brought the looked-for determination on my sister's dining-room table i noticed a letter bearing the address miss rosa w 
astonished i asked whose name this was and was informed that the right name of the supposed dora was really rosa and that on accepting the position she had to lay aside her name because rosa would also refer to my sister i said pityingly poor people they cannot even retain their own names i now recall that on hearing this i became quiet for a moment and began to think of all sorts of serious matters which merged into the obscure but which i could now easily bring into my consciousness thus when i sought a name for a person who could not retain her own name no other except dora occurred to me the exclusiveness here is based moreover on firmer internal associations for in the history of my patient it was a stranger in the house the governess who exerted a decisive influence on the course of the treatment this slight incident found its unexpected continuation many years later while discussing in a lecture the long since published history of the girl called dora it occurred to me that one of my two women pupils had the very name dora which i was obliged to utter so often in the different associations of the case i turned to the young student whom i knew personally with the apology that i had really not thought that she bore the same name and that i was ready to substitute it in my lecture by another name i was now confronted with the task of rapidly choosing another name and reflected that i must not now choose the first name of the other woman student and so set a poor example to the class who were already quite conversant with psychoanalysis i was therefore well pleased when the name erna occurred to me as a substitute for dora and erna i used in the discourse after the lecture i asked myself whence the name erna could possibly have originated and had to laugh as i observed that the feared possibility in the choice of the substitutive name had come to pass in part at least the other lady's family name was lucerna of which erna was a part in a letter to a friend i informed him that i had finished reading the proof-sheets of the interpretation of dreams and that i did not intend to make any further changes in it even if it contained two thousand four hundred and sixty-seven mistakes i immediately attempted to explain to myself the number and added the little analysis as a postscript to the letter it will be best to quote it now as i wrote it when i caught myself in this transaction Quote, I will add hastily another contribution to the psychopathology of everyday life. You will find in the letter the number 2467 as a jocose and arbitrary estimation of the number of errors that may be found in the dream book. I meant to write, no matter how large the number might be, and this one presented itself. But there is nothing arbitrary or undetermined in the psychic life. You will therefore rightly suppose that the unconscious hastened to determine the number which was liberated by consciousness. Just previous to this I had read in the paper that General E. M. had been retired as Inspector General of Ordnance. You must know that I am interested in this man. While I was serving as military medical student, he, then a colonel, once came into the hospital and said to the physician, You must make me well in eight days, as I have some work to do for which the emperor is waiting. At that time I decided to follow this man's career, and just think, today, 1899, he is at the end of it, inspector general of ordnance, and already retired. I wished to figure out in what time he had covered this road, and assumed that I had seen him in the hospital in 1882. That would make seventeen years. I related this to my wife, and she remarked, Then you too should be retired. And I protested, The Lord forbid. After this conversation I seated myself at the table to write to you. The previous train of thought continued, and for good reason. The figuring was incorrect. I had a definite recollection of the circumstances in my mind. I had celebrated my coming of age, my twenty-fourth birthday, in the military prison, for being absent without permission. Therefore I must have seen him in 1880, which makes it nineteen years ago. You then have the number twenty-four in 2467. 
now take the number that represents my age forty-three and add twenty-four years to it and you get sixty-seven that is to the question whether i wish to retire i had expressed the wish to work twenty-four years more obviously i am annoyed that in the interval during which i followed colonel m i have not accomplished much myself and still there is a sort of triumph in the fact that he is already finished while i have all before me thus we may justly say that not even the unintentionally thrown out number two thousand four hundred sixty seven lacks its determination from the unconscious since the first example of the interpretation of an apparently arbitrary choice of a number i have repeated a similar test with the same result but most cases are of such intimate content that they do not lend themselves to report it is for this reason that i shall not hesitate to add here a very interesting analysis of a chance number which dr alfred adler of vienna received from a perfectly healthy man a wrote to me last night i devoted myself to the psychopathology of everyday life and i would have read it all through had i not been hindered by a remarkable coincidence when i read that every number that we apparently conjure up quite arbitrarily in our consciousness has a definite meaning i decided to test it the number one thousand seven hundred thirty four occurred to my mind the following associations then came up one thousand seven hundred thirty four divided by seventeen equals one hundred two one hundred two divided by seventeen equals six i then separated the number into seventeen and thirty-four i am thirty-four years old i believe that i once told you that i consider thirty-four the last year of youth and for this reason i felt miserable on my last birthday the end of my seventeenth year was the beginning of a very nice and interesting period of my development i divide my life into periods of seventeen years what do the divisions signify the number one hundred two recalls the fact that volume one o two of the reclam universal library is kotzebue's play human hatred and repentance my present psychic state is human hatred and repentance number six of the u l i know a great many numbers by heart is molner's schold fault i am constantly annoyed at the thought that it is through my own fault that i have not become what i could have been with my abilities i then asked myself what is number seventeen of the u l but i could not recall it but as i positively knew it before i assumed that i wished to forget this number all reflection was in vain i wished to continue with my reading but i read only mechanically without understanding a word for i was annoyed by the number seventeen i extinguished the light and continued my search it finally came to me that number seventeen must be a play by shakespeare but which one i thought of hero and leander apparently a stupid attempt of my will to distract me i finally arose and consulted the catalogue of the u l number seventeen was macbeth to my surprise i had to discover that i knew nothing of the play despite the fact that it did not interest me any less than any other shakespearean drama i only thought of murder lady macbeth witches nice is ugly and that i found schiller's version of macbeth very nice undoubtedly i also wished to forget the play then it occurred to me that seventeen and thirty-four may be divided by seventeen and result in one and two numbers one and two of the u l is goethe's faust formerly i found much of faust in me End quote. we must regret that the discretion of the physician did not allow us to see the significance of ideas adler remarked that the man did not succeed in the synthesis of his analysis his association would hardly be worth reporting unless their continuation would bring out something that would give us a key to the understanding of the number one thousand seven hundred thirty four and the whole series of ideas to quote further to be sure this morning i had an experience which speaks much for the correctness of the freudian conception my wife whom i awakened through my getting up at night 
asked me what i wanted with the catalogue of the u l i told her the story she found it all pettifogging but very interesting macbeth which caused me so much trouble she simply passed over she said that nothing came to her mind when she thought of a number i answered let us try it she named the number one hundred seventeen to this i immediately replied seventeen refers to what i just told you furthermore i told you yesterday that if a wife is in the eighty-second year and the husband is in the thirty-fifth year it must be a gross misunderstanding for the last few days i have been teasing my wife by maintaining that she was a little old mother of eighty-two years eighty-two plus thirty-five is one hundred seventeen the man who did not know how to determine his own number at once found the solution when his wife named a number which was apparently arbitrarily chosen as a matter of fact the woman understood very well from which complex the number of her husband originated and chose her own number from the same complex which was surely common to both as it dealt in his case with their relative ages now we find it easy to interpret the number that occurred to the man as dr adler indicates it expressed a repressed wish of the husband which fully developed would read for a man of thirty-four years as i am only a woman of seventeen would be suitable lest one should think too lightly of such playing i will add that i was recently informed by dr adler that a year after the publication of this analysis the man was divorced from his wife adler gives a similar explanation for the origin of obsessive numbers also the choice of so-called favorite numbers is not without relation to the life of the person concerned and does not lack a certain psychologic interest a gentleman who evinced a particular partiality for the numbers seventeen and nineteen would specify after brief reflection that at the age of seventeen he attained the greatly longed-for academic freedom by having been admitted to the university and at nineteen he made his first long journey and shortly thereafter made his first scientific discovery but the fixation of this preference followed later after two questionable affairs when the same numbers were invested with importance in his love life indeed even those numbers which we use in a particular connection extremely often and with apparent arbitrariness can be traced by analysis to an unexpected meaning thus one day it struck one of my patients that he was particularly fond of saying i have already told you this from seventeen to thirty-six times and he asked himself whether there was any motive for it it soon occurred to him that he was born on the twenty-seventh day of the month and that his younger brother was born on the twenty-sixth day of another month and he had grounds for complaint that fate had robbed him of so many of the benefits of life only to bestow them on his younger brother thus he represented this partiality of fate by deducting ten from the date of his birth and adding it to the date of his brother's birthday i am the elder and yet i am so cut short i shall tarry a little longer at the analysis of such numbers for i know of no other individual observation which would so readily demonstrate the existence of highly organized thinking processes of which consciousness has no knowledge moreover there is no better example of analysis in which the suggestion of the position of frequent accusation is so distinctly out of consideration i shall therefore report the analysis of a chance number of one of my patients with his consent to which i will only add that he is the youngest of many children and that he lost his beloved father in his young years while in a particularly happy mood he let the number four hundred and twenty six thousand seven hundred and eighteen come to his mind and put to himself the question well what does it bring to your mind first came a joke he had heard if your catarrh of the nose is treated by a doctor it lasts forty-two days if it is not treated it lasts six weeks this corresponds to the first digit of the number forty-two equals six times seven during the obstruction that followed this first solution i called his attention to the fact that the number of six digits selected by him 
contains all the first numbers except three and five he at once found the continuation of this solution Quote, we are altogether seven children i was the youngest number three in the order of the children corresponds to my sister a and five to my brother l both of them were my enemies as a child i used to pray to the lord every night that he should take out of my life these two tormenting spirits it seems to me that i have fulfilled for myself this wish three and five the evil brother and hated sister are omitted if the number stands for your sisters and brothers what significance is there to eighteen at the end you were altogether only seven i often thought that if my father had lived longer i should not have been the youngest child if one more would have come it should have been eight and there would have been a younger child toward whom i could have played the role of the older one End quote with this the number was explained but we still wish to find the connection between the first part of the interpretation and the part following it this came very readily from the condition required for the last digit if the father had lived longer forty two equals six times seven signifies the ridicule directed against the doctors who could not help his father and in this way expresses the wish for the continued existence of the father the whole number really corresponds to the fulfillment of his two wishes in reference to his family circle namely that both the evil brother and sister should die and that another child should follow him or briefly expressed if only these two had died in place of my father another analysis of numbers i take from jones a gentleman of his acquaintance let the number nine hundred eighty six come to his mind and defied him to connect it to anything of special interest in his mind Quote, six years ago on the hottest day he could remember he had seen a joke in an evening newspaper which stated that the thermometer had stood at ninety eight point six degrees fahrenheit evidently an exaggeration of ninety eight point six degrees fahrenheit we were at the time seated in front of a very hot fire from which he had just drawn back and he remarked probably quite correctly that the heat had aroused his dormant memory however i was curious to know why this memory had persisted with such vividness as to be so readily brought out for with most people it surely would have been forgotten beyond recall unless it had become associated with some other mental experience of more significance he told me that on reading the joke he had laughed uproariously and that on many subsequent occasions he had recalled it with great relish as the joke was obviously of an exceedingly tenuous nature this strengthened my expectation that more lay behind his next thought was the general reflection that the conception of heat had always greatly impressed him that heat was the most important thing in the universe the source of all life and so on this remarkable attitude of a quite prosaic young man certainly needed some explanation so i asked him to continue his free associations the next thought was of a factory stack which he could see from his bedroom window he often stood of an evening watching the flame and smoke issuing out of it and reflecting on this deplorable waste of energy heat flame the source of life the waste of vital energy issuing from an upright hollow tube it was not hard to divine from such associations that the ideas of heat and fire were unconsciously linked in his mind with the idea of love as is so frequent in symbolic thinking and that there was a strong masturbation complex present a conclusion that he presently confirmed End quote those who wish to get a good impression of the way the material of numbers becomes elaborated in the unconscious thinking i refer to two papers by jung and jones in personal analysis of this kind two things were especially striking first the absolute somnambulistic certainty with which i attacked the unknown objective point merging into mathematical train of thought which later suddenly extended to the looked-for number and the rapidity with which the entire subsequent work was performed secondly the fact that the numbers were always at the disposal of my unconscious mind 
when as a matter of fact i am a poor mathematician and find it very difficult to consciously recall years house numbers and the like moreover in these unconscious mental operations with figures i found a tendency to superstition the origin of which had long remained unknown to me it will not surprise us to find that not only numbers but also mental occurrences of different kinds of words regularly prove on analytic investigation to be well determined brill relates quote, while working on the english edition of this book i was obsessed one morning with the strange word cardillac busily intent on my work i refused at first to pay attention to it but as is usually the case i simply could not do anything else cardillac was constantly on my mind realizing that my refusal to recognize it was only a resistance i decided to analyze it the following associations occurred to me cardillac cardiac car four cadillac cardiac recalled cardalgia heartache a medical friend who had recently told me confidentially that he feared that he had some cardiac affection because he had suffered some attacks of pain in the region of his heart knowing him so well i at once rejected his theory and told him that his attacks were of a neurotic character and that his other apparent physical ailments were also only the expression of his neurosis i might add that just before telling me of his heart trouble he spoke of a business matter of vital interest to him which had suddenly come to naught being a man of unbound ambitions he was very depressed because of late he had suffered many similar reverses his neurotic conflicts however had become manifest a few months before this misfortune soon after his father's death had left a big business on his hands as the business could be continued only under my friend's management he was unable to decide whether to enter into commercial life or continue his chosen career his great ambition was to become a successful medical practitioner and although he had practised medicine successfully for many years he was not altogether satisfied with the financial fluctuations of his professional income on the other hand his father's business promised him an assured though limited return in brief he was at a crossing and did not know which way to turn i then recalled the word carrefour which is the french for crossing and it occurred to me that while working in a hospital in paris i lived near the carrefour saint lazare and now i could understand what relation all these associations had for me when i resolved to leave the state hospital i made the decision first because i desired to get married and secondly because i wished to enter private practice this brought up a new problem although my state hospital service was an absolute success judging by promotions and so on i felt like a great many others in the same situation namely that my training was ill-suited for private practice to specialize in mental work was a daring undertaking for one without money and social connections i also felt that the best i could do for patients should they ever come my way would be to commit them to one of the hospitals as i had little confidence in the home treatment in vogue in spite of the enormous advances made in recent years in mental work the specialist is almost helpless when he is confronted with the average case of insanity this may be partially attributed to the fact that such cases are brought to him after they have fully developed the psychosis when hospital treatment is imperative of the great army of milder mental disturbances the so-called borderline cases which make up the bulk of clinic and private work and which rightfully belong to the mental specialist i knew very little as those patients rarely or never came to the state hospital and what i did know concerning the treatment of neurasthenia and psychasthenia was not conducive to make me more hopeful of success in private practice it was in this state of mind that i came to paris where i hoped to learn enough about the psychoneuroses to enable me to continue my specialty in private practice and yet feel that i could do something for my patients what i saw in paris did not however help to change my state of mind there too most of the work was directed to dead tissues the mental aspects as such 
received but scant attention i was therefore seriously thinking of giving up my mental work for some other specialty as can be seen i was confronted with a situation similar to the one of my medical friend i too was at a crossing and did not know which way to turn my suspense was soon ended one day i received a letter from my friend professor peterson who by the way was responsible for my entering the state hospital service in this letter he advised me not to give up my work and suggested the psychiatric clinic of zurich where he thought i could find what i desired but what does cadillac mean cadillac is the name of a hotel and of an automobile a few days before in a country place my medical friend and i had been trying to hire an automobile but there was none to be had we both expressed the wish to own an automobile again an unrealized ambition i also recalled that the carrefour de saint lazare always impressed me as being one of the busiest thoroughfares in paris it was always congested with automobiles cadillac also recalled that only a few days ago on the way to my clinic i noticed a large sign over a building which announced that on a certain day this building was to be occupied by the cadillac etc this at first made me think of the cadillac hotel but on second sight i noticed that it referred to the cadillac motor car there was a sudden obstruction here for a few moments the word cadillac reappeared and by sound association the word catalogue occurred to me this word brought back a very mortifying occurrence of recent origin the motive of which is again blighted ambition when one wishes to report any auto-analysis he must be prepared to lay bare many intimate affairs of his own life any one reading carefully professor freud's works cannot fail to become intimately acquainted with him and his family i have often been asked by persons who claim to have read and studied freud's works such questions as how old is freud is freud married how many children has he etc whenever i hear these or similar questions i know that the questioner has either lied when he made these assertions or to be more charitable that he is a very careless and superficial reader all these questions and many more are answered in freud's works auto-analyses are autobiographies par excellence but whereas the autobiographer may for definite reasons consciously and unconsciously hide many facts of his life the auto-analyst not only tells the truth consciously but perforce brings to light his whole intimate personality it is for these reasons that one finds it very unpleasant to report his own auto-analyses however as we often report our patients unconscious productions it is but fair that we should sacrifice ourselves on the altar of publicity when occasion demands this is my apology for having thrust some of my personal affairs on the reader and for being obliged to continue a little longer in the same strain before digressing with the last remark i mentioned that the word cadillac brought the sound association catalogue this association brought back another important epoch in my life with which professor peterson is connected last may i was informed by the secretary of the faculty that i was appointed chief of clinic of the department of psychiatry i need hardly say that i was exceedingly pleased to be so honored in the first place because it was the realization of an ambition which i dared entertain only under special euphoric states and secondly it was a compensation for the many unmerited criticisms from those who are blindly and unreasonably opposing some of my work soon thereafter i called on the stenographer of the faculty and spoke to her about a correction to be made in my name as it was printed in the catalogue for some unknown reason perhaps racial prejudice this stenographer a maiden lady must have taken a dislike to me for about three years i repeatedly requested her to have this correction made but she had paid no attention to me to be sure she always promised to attend to it but the mistake remained uncorrected when i saw her last may i again reminded her of this correction and also called her attention to the fact that as i had been appointed chief of clinic i was especially anxious to have my name correctly printed in the catalogue 
she apologized for her remissness and assured me that everything should be as i requested imagine my surprise and chagrin when on receiving the new catalogue i found that while the correction had been made in my name i was not listed as chief of clinic when i asked her about this she was quite puzzled she said she had no idea that i had been appointed chief of clinic she had to consult the minutes of the faculty written by her before she was convinced of it it should be noted that as recorder to the faculty it was her duty to know all these things as soon as they transpired when she finally ascertained that i was right she was very apologetic and informed me that she would at once write to the superintendent of the clinic to inform him of my appointment something which she should have done months before of course i gained nothing by her regrets and apologies the catalogue was published and those who read it did not find my name in the desired place i am chief of clinic in fact but not in name moreover as the appointments are made only for one year it is quite likely that my great ambition will never be actually realized thus the obsessive neologism cardillac which is a condensation of cardiac cadillac and catalogue contains some of the most important efforts of my medical experience when i was almost at the end of this analysis i suddenly recalled a dream containing this neologism cardillac in which my wish was realized my name appeared in its rightful place in the catalogue the person who showed it to me in the dream was professor peterson it was when i was at the first crossing after i had graduated from the medical college that professor peterson urged me to enter the hospital service about five years later while i was in the state of indecision which i have described it was professor peterson who advised me to go to the clinic of psychiatry at zurich where through bluller and jung i first became acquainted with professor freud and his works and it was also through the kind recommendation of dr peterson that i was elevated to my present position i am indebted to dr hitchman for the solution of another case in which a line of poetry repeatedly obtruded itself on the mind in a certain place without showing any trace of its origin and relation related by dr e quote, six years ago i travelled from biarritz to san sebastian the railroad crosses over the bidasio a river which here forms the boundary between france and spain on the bridge one has a splendid view on the one side of the broad valley and the pyrenees and on the other of the sea it was a beautiful bright summer day everything was filled with sun and light i was on a vacation and pleased with my trip to spain suddenly the following words came to me but the soul is already free floating on a sea of light at that time i was trying to remember where these lines came from but i could not remember judging by the rhythm the words must be part of some poem which however entirely escaped my memory later when the verse repeatedly came to my mind i asked many people about it without receiving any information last year i crossed the same bridge on my return journey from spain it was a very dark night and it rained i looked through the window to ascertain whether we had already reached the frontier station and noticed that we were on the bidasio bridge immediately the above cited verse returned to my memory and again i could not recall its origin at home many months later i found uhland's poem i opened the volume and my glance fell upon the verse but the soul is already free floating on a sea of light which were the concluding lines of the poem entitled the pilgrim i read the poem and dimly recalled that i had known it many years ago the scene of action is in spain and this seemed to me to be the only relation between the quoted verse and the place on the railroad journey described by me i was only half satisfied with my discovery and mechanically continued to turn the pages of the book on turning the next page i found a poem the title of which was Bedasio bridge i may add that the contents of this poem seemed even stranger to me than that of the first and that its first verse read on the Bedasio bridge stands a saint gray with age he blesses to the right the spanish mountain to the left he blesses the french land End quote. two 
this understanding of the determination of apparently arbitrarily selected names numbers and words may perhaps contribute to the solution of another problem as is known many persons argue against the assumption of an absolute psychic determinism by referring to an intense feeling of conviction that there is a free will this feeling of conviction exists but is not incompatible with the belief in determinism like any normal feelings it must be justified by something but so far as i can observe it does not manifest itself in weighty and important decisions on these occasions one has much more the feeling of a psychic compulsion and gladly falls back upon it compare luther's here i stand i cannot do anything else on the other hand it is in trivial and indifferent decisions that one feels sure that he could just as easily have acted differently that he acted of his own free will and without any motives from our analyses we therefore need not contest the right of the feeling of conviction that there is a free will if we distinguish conscious from unconscious motivation we are then informed by the feeling of conviction that the conscious motivation does not extend over all our motor resolutions minima non curat praetor what is thus left free from the one side receives its motive from the other side from the unconscious and the determinism in the psychic realm is thus carried out uninterruptedly end of section twelve